Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we give the Lord the glory today for this new chapter. And as we spoke about this last week, about the, the devil, how he operates in two different ways, how we're supposed to be aware of the devil's attacks. It's important that we're aware of these things as we move forward as a congregation. But also it's important as well to move forward in love and unity, which is something which is uh, absolutely essential for any congregation. You know, we can, uh, we can go out evangelizing, we can have all the knowledge about the last days and all this kind of stuff and, and support Israel. But if we're not moving forward in love and unity, then, then it's basically founded upon nothing, isn't it? Because Jesus is love. So we need to make love and unity kind of the foundation of how we move forward as a congregation. And the Bible speaks an awful lot about love and unity. For example, in the time of the, in the upper room, the Passover, the uh, Last Supper, before Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, that time in the upper room begins with a commandment to love one another. And it also ends with an exhortation to be united as one. So it's kind of like that time in the upper room is sandwiched between this idea of love and unity. So John 13, verse 34 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you. So it's not just love one another, but it's love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this, we'll know, you will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So how do we actually achieve a love like this for one another, where Jesus says that we must love one another as he has loved us. Well, Ephesians chapter 4 is a chapter in the Bible that speaks an awful lot about this. So please turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Those who have heard me teach on the book of Ephesians before, the book of Ephesians is kind of written in a very clever way in that it's divided into two halves. Chapters 1 to 3, Paul focuses on everything that God has done for you all that God has done for you and everything that you need to know before you can even think about how you're going to walk with him. Ephesians 1 to 3 is basically sitting and knowing what God has done for you. People would always say, don't run before you can walk, but also don't walk before you can sit. Don't walk until you can sit and just digest and take in and understand everything that God has done for you. I did a sermon about Ephesians chapter 1 back in last summer, which talks about the spiritual blessings that God has blessed us with in the heavenly places, how he's redeemed us, forgiven us of all our sin by the blood of Christ, predestined us to an inheritance, and all the spiritual blessings that come with the, the salvation package. And this thought continues on into chapters 2 and 3. It's not until chapter 4 where Paul then begins to shift the focus upon you, and what you must do in response to what God has done. Now remember, everything that we do for God must always been, be in response to what he has done for us. There's nothing that we can ever do to earn God's favor. There's nothing we can ever do to deserve eternal life or God's grace. It's all about what God has done for us by sending Jesus Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. But everything that we do for God is in response to what he has done for us. And that is why the book of Ephesians is written in the way that it is, in that, first of all, Paul emphasizes in chapters 1 to 3 everything that God has done for the Ephesians and also for you and I. And then in chapter 4, it is now where Paul says, this is now how you must respond. This is now how you, how you must walk. You've sat, you've had time to learn everything God has done for you. Now it's time to start walking again. Don't run before you can walk, but don't walk before you can sit as well. That is how the book of Ephesians is modelled. So in chapter 4 now, this is where Paul begins to shift the focus on your response to what God has done for you. Ephesians 4 from verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. So there you go, Paul is now saying, walk worthy of to the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. Now the word there, lowliness, pretty much every other translation translates it as humility, humble, humbleness. We are to be humble, walking with humility, lowliness. And the word there in the Greek for bearing with one another 
means to be patient with one another. It's a neko in Greek. It means to be patient, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. We've all received an abundant measure of God's grace in our lives, haven't we? Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. That's actually a quote from Psalm 68, verse 18 right there. Now this, he ascended, what does that mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all, all things. That's basically a reference to Jesus going down into Hades to set the captives free who are waiting for the Messiah to come. There's references about that in First Peter. Verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. This is why God has put these things in place for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. I'll come back to that verse a bit later. By the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Who is the head? Christ, isn't he? He's the head of the church, not the Pope. Christ is the head of the church. Verse 16 from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about that, how there's many parts of the body. A body does not consist of a bunch of hands or a bunch of feet or a bunch of heads. A body has different parts for different functions. And that's exactly how the body of Christ works, in that there are different members and different giftings and different callings, all of which are essential for the functioning of the body. Now, it's the same with any team, isn't it? If you had a soccer team, for example, you'll have guys with different abilities. The guys who play at the back in defense tend to be quite big guys, normally over six foot, not normally the quickest guys, but they're normally quite tough guys, aren't they? The guys who play in midfield, You know, you've got some of them quicker guys who are really, really nippy. You've got some of the guys who are quite aggressive. They play midfield as well. And then at the front, in the the strikers, you've got, you know, the guys who are really accurate with their shots and passes and things like this. So you've got a wide range of different abilities in a soccer team. It's the same with the body of Christ. We all have different giftings and callings, all of which are essential to the body. Again, more about that in 1 Corinthians 12. Verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. So Paul here is talking to Gentiles, don't forget, and Gentiles were by nature pagan. They used to worship pagan gods. In fact, in Hebrew, the word goy, Gentile, also means pagan as well because they were Gentile nations, goyim. Do not walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Again, some of these Gentiles, still to this day, nothing has changed. Pretty, pretty dark, depraved practices that we see among the Gentile nations. Who, being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Being past feeling. Did you hear that? 1 Timothy 4 talks about one having their conscience seared with a hot iron. These people basically go so far and deep into their sin that they go past the point of no return. God basically hands them over to their sin. Romans 1 talks about this, doesn't it? Romans 1 talks about how God abandons people to their sin 
basically because they are past feeling. Their conscience basically no longer functions. They're not even aware or sensitive to what sin even is. And that's why they basically live this life dark and alienated from God. Verse 20, But you have not so learned about Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God. So we're literally to throw off our old sinful nature, just like you would take off an old ragged garment. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago when we looked at Zechariah chapter 3. Our old filthy garments, the sinful garments that we once had. We literally throw them off like an old garment and then we put on the new man, the new nature. Peter says we are now partakers of the divine nature. So in other words, we don't have that sinful nature anymore. We now have the nature of God. We now love the same things that God loves and we hate the same things that God hates. Before we was born again, it was the other way around, wasn't it? The world hates what God loves and loves what God hates. But now, when we come into the kingdom of God, it's flipped around, isn't it? We are now in line with his word and that is why we are partakers of the divine nature, as Peter says. Verse 24, put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So lying is something that the Bible condemns multiple times. Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Satan is the father of lies, isn't he? And I will say one thing about this church in particular, that those who God has moved out of this church, I think they all have one thing in common, is that every single one of them has been found lying. Verse 26, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Be angry and do not sin. Why is it saying... Be angry and do not sin. It's not saying don't be angry and don't sin. It's saying be angry and do not sin. Because anger is not a bad thing, as long as it's righteous anger. There's many examples of righteous anger we can draw from Scripture. The most obvious one being when Jesus entered the temple to see all the corruption going on and made a whip of cords and drove out all the corrupt money changers. An example of righteous anger. Anger is a good thing. The reason that Jesus was so angry when he saw what he saw It's because, A, it was taking place in the house of God, not the first time Jesus ever saw corruption, you can be sure, but when it was taking place in the house of God, that's different. And also because of his his godly nature. Hebrews 1 tells us he is the exact imprint of the nature of God. So the anger that he had was righteous anger. And this is what this is talking about. Be angry and do not sin. In other words, don't let your anger become unrighteous anger, uncontrollable anger. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, get your anger out now and sort out your problems before you go to sleep. Don't go to sleep angry because, what does it say? Nor give place to the devil. In other words, if you go to sleep on your anger, if you go to sleep having unresolved wrath, then you've given a foothold to the devil. This is how the devil gets in. He uses opportunities like this. And it's your job to minimize those opportunities for the enemy. When the enemy comes into someone's life, it's because they've given him a foothold. 28, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that, may, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So in other words, our speech and our language must be godly. Foul language has no place in the church, Foul language has no place in the life of a saint, one who has been born again. Foul language does not belong in the life of a saint. Colossians 4.6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Yes, brothers and sisters, 
you can grieve the Holy Spirit by the way you live. If you are living in opposition to God's word, if you are living in disobedience, then you will grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, do not confuse that with salvation, because if you're not saved, there wouldn't be a Holy Spirit in you to grieve, would there? The reason that the Holy Spirit is grieved when you disobey is because the Holy Spirit does live in you. And that is actually what differentiates between a child of God and a child of wrath. The child of wrath can sin all they want and go back for more. The child of God is not comfortable in sin because it grieves the spirit that's in them, the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now verse 32. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The way Jesus told us to love one another was to love one another as I have loved you. And the way that we are supposed to, one, to love one another in this way is to show each other grace, because Jesus showed us grace. When we refuse to show other people grace, we are not acting in accordance with the nature God has given us. Because however much grace you are required to show somebody... It's not even a fraction of the grace that you have received from God through Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible allows no room or no place for people to withhold grace from others. In Colossians chapter 3, there's a similar passage because the epistle to the Colossians and the epistle to the Ephesians are quite similar. There's a lot of the same problems that Paul's addressing here. So in Colossians 3, in verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God... As the elect of God. Remember, election is corporate. The bride of Christ is elect. And of course, Israel is elect. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility. There's that word again, humility. Meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. We saw that in Ephesians 2, didn't we? Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. So we are to forgive one another just as God has forgiven us. We are to show grace to one another just as God has shown grace to us. And remember, however much grace you must show, it's nothing compared to the grace that you have already received simply by Jesus sacrificing his life for you. That is the grace you have received. And in order for us to love one another, the way Jesus commanded us to is to show grace to one another. Again, verse 32 in Ephesians 4. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So that is how we are to love one another, is to show grace. Now, grace is always easy to receive, isn't it? Everyone wants to receive grace, but when it comes to giving grace, that's different, isn't it? People always want to receive grace, but they don't always want to give it. Well, we're supposed to give grace in the same measure that we've received it. And we've received grace from Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are to also give grace too. Again, no one has any right to withhold grace based on the grace that they have already received. We are supposed to correct one another in love, as it says. We are supposed to show humility. And again, Jesus laid out a whole process for this kind of thing if someone has a problem or an issue they are to go to that person then they are to take one or two witnesses again you're not to go off gossiping about this person you're not supposed to go off spreading lies or slander you're supposed to go to that person in love and in humility showing grace now again grace is something which is always easy to receive but never easy to give is it but we are commanded to. Again, it's not an option that God gives us. It's not advice that he gives us. It is a commandment that we are to show grace to one another. And guess what? Leaders need grace too. Why is everyone so shocked? Leaders need grace too. In fact, leaders need more grace. Do you know, what? Do you know why leaders need more grace? Because everyone thinks that leaders never put a foot wrong, don't they? Everyone thinks that leaders have it all right and that they're incapable of getting anything wrong. And when they do, it's a shock, isn't it? I can't believe it. Leaders need more grace than anybody, I would say. I'm not just saying that because I'm leading myself. Leaders need more grace because of the responsibility that they have. James chapter 3, verse 1 says, Let few of you be teachers, because teachers will come under greater judgment. Again, leaders need more grace because of the position and responsibility and burden that's upon their shoulders. So we're to show grace to our leaders as well, as well as showing grace to one another. 
And again, I'll say, if you're looking for a perfect church with perfect people, then you're going to be looking for a very, very long time. A perfect church with perfect people does not exist. We are an imperfect church full of imperfect people who serve a perfect God and a perfect Savior. Aren't we, brothers and sisters? Hallelujah. Turn now to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to look at a couple of passages from Philippians, which again talks a lot about love and how our love is to look. Because the world has its own idea of love, doesn't it? We even hear every June, love is love. Well, that's the world's idea of love. That's not God's idea of love. God's idea of love is actually found here in Philippians chapter 1 from verse 9. Is everyone there? Philippians chapter 1 in verse 9. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Did you hear that? That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment. That you may approve the things which are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ. The word there, sincere, is quite interesting because in Latin it literally means without wax. In French it would be sincere, and in Spanish it's very similar. Sincere, it literally means without wax. Now, when they used to sell all these statues in the Roman markets, they would often have statues that were, for example, chipped. They'd be like a nose that had been chipped off. So what they'd do is they'd grind down the marble, they'd mix it with wax, and then they'd try and make the nose look look new again in order to be able to sell it in other words it's not sincere it's not without wax and then what happens in that hot middle eastern sun is that wax melts and then that nose falls apart because it's been faked well that's what it's telling us to be we are to be without wax again it's literally the word sincere it means without wax we are to be genuine we're to be authentic not fake without offense till the day of christ so our love is to abound in knowledge and all discernment. In other words, if you don't have knowledge of the Word of God, if you don't have discernment, then you can't show love to others. You can't show biblical love to others. You can show worldly love, the world's idea of love, but in order to show biblical, godly love, you must have knowledge of the God who is love. And in order to do that, you must have knowledge of His Word. You can't know God without knowing His Word. Our knowledge... Uh, love must abound in all knowledge and discernment. If you have no knowledge of the word of God, then you can't display biblical godly love. This is why so many people go around saying all this nonsense about love is love, because they have no knowledge of God. They have no knowledge of God, they have no knowledge of his word. That's why they have a worldly idea of love. You've heard me speak about Balaam before, the way of Balaam. The way of Balaam is a term from 2 Peter in chapter 2, verse 15, what did Balaam do? Balaam encouraged sin. He told King Balak that these Israelites, if you want them to be cursed, then you're going to have to get them to sin and disobey against their God. Then they'll be cursed. Balaam tried to curse them, but God put different words in his mouth, didn't he? And that's why Balaam said, if you want them to be cursed, you get them to sin, and then they'll be cursed. And then they sent down all the pagan Moabite women and they committed acts of fornication and idolatry with these women. And what happened? That plague came among the Israelites and wiped out 24,000 Israelites, didn't it? And Phineas is the one who stopped that plague with his action. So that is what happens when sin is encouraged. It's the way of Balaam. When these churches call themselves LGBT inclusive or LGBT affirming, they're taking the way of Balaam. They're not taking God's way. They're not showing love the way Philippians chapter 1 tells us to. They're taking the way of Balaam. They're encouraging their sin. They're encouraging and pushing them further down the path of destruction that they're already on. That's the way of Balaam. When people are encouraging sin and not telling people to repent and to turn back to Jesus, that is the way of Balaam. Romans chapter 1 verse 32 talks about this in how... These people are deserving of death, but not just these people, the ones who approve of it as well. Did you know that? Not only are these sinners are the ones who are worthy of death, but it's also the ones who approve of them who are also worthy of death, according to Romans 1.32. Romans 12 verse 9 says, love must be sincere. There's that word sincere again, without wax. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. 
If you want to love what is good, then you'll also, by default, hate what is evil. Does God hate? Yes, he does. He hates what is evil. He hates sin. He loves and he also hates. In fact, the reason that he loves is because he hates. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6, the love chapter. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. They're out there rejoicing in iniquity every June, aren't they? They're not rejoicing in the truth, are they? So your love must be rooted in God's word and rooted in the knowledge of God's word. If your love for others is not rooted in the word of God, then it's nothing more than emotionally driven hype. That's all it is. We hear all this love is love nonsense all the time. We hear all this we must love others all the time. It's not rooted in God's word. God's word is love. Now, of course, we've spoken about how we love one another, how we must show grace to one another, and how we must also show love in the knowledge of the word of God. In other words, we must not be encouraging people to live a life which is contrary to the word of God, just as Balaam did. But also, unity is something that is just as essential because I don't see a a massive difference in the two. In fact, the two are not mutually exclusive because I don't think you can have love without unity and you can't have unity without love. These two go hand in hand. That's why I like this theme, love and unity. So John 17, now at the time when the upper room is coming to an end, John 17 verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's actually Jesus praying for you because he's not praying there just for the disciples. He prays for the disciples first, but then from verse 20 in chapter 17, he then prays for all who will believe. So this is Jesus' personal prayer about you. But for all who believe in me through their word, that they will all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So Jesus here is praying that we may be one. Now, of course, the ecumenical clan use this to say, yes, we must all be one. We must all unite, even if it's churches who are not practicing the word of God, even if it's churches who pray to the dead or affirm homosexual marriage. We must still unite because Jesus said we must be one. The thing is, they don't read verse 19, what he said just before that. In verse 19, he said, For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Jesus never, ever commands us to be one with those who are not in the truth, those who are not sanctified in the truth. He is not saying we must become one with anyone or any church who is outside of the truth of the word of God. We are not to become one with them. The Bible says we are to separate from them. We are to be one with like-minded children of God, those who are sanctified in the truth. We are to be one just as Jesus and the Father are one. And of course, that means having unity in the doctrine of Christ, the basic doctrine of Christ. We must all have unity in doctrine. Because what does it say in Matthew 12? A house divided cannot stand. A house divided cannot stand. And that's actually one of the issues that Paul addresses with the Corinthian church as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Straight away in the first chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The reason that there's so many churches who are divided, that they have a million different doctrines going around the congregation, is because they're not united in the truth. They're united in error, aren't they? We have to be united in the truth and we have to speak the same thing. We have to have the same doctrine, the biblical doctrine that Jesus and the apostles taught. Look what it says in Ephesians 4 that we just read. We read it in Ephesians 4 in verse 14 that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love. Every wind of doctrine. Remember what the Hebrew word is for wind? Ruach. What else does ruach mean? Spirit. Spirit and wind are the same thing in Hebrew thought. So every one of these doctrines, the false doctrines, doctrines of demons, which Paul calls them in 1 Timothy 4, they all have demons behind them. 
They all have spirits behind them. Every false doctrine that you encounter, there is a demon, false demon behind it. And this is why, as a church, we insist on our statement of faith. This is why we have a statement of faith. This is why we have membership courses, so that those who come into this particular fellowship are united in the same mind and in the same doctrine. We don't want people coming in bringing different doctrines that are not the doctrines of the Bible. We want people coming in who are of one mind with us. This is why we have our statement of faith. This is why we have our membership courses. Romans 16, in verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So these people come in with all these different doctrines and it's always in their own interest and their own agenda that they bring. Amos 3.3, how can two walk together unless they are agreed? That applies to anybody. I'd say especially marriage because it's how can two walk together unless they are agreed? This is why so many churches are divided because they have a million different doctrines being thrown around their congregants. They have people coming in who believe this and the church is purposely given the freedom to believe this. If you want to believe that, then that's fine. This is what churches do now. They're too scared to challenge people's views. Again, it's just their views. It's not based on scripture. It's based on their opinions and their emotions, isn't it? This is why these people come in with these different things because their understanding and their doctrine is not based on the word of God anymore. It's based on their own emotion and their own feeling. That is what we have in most modern churches these days. So many people say to me, especially when I, when I preach every June about the parading their sin like Sodom. People often say to me after that, man, if, I wonder what it would be like if you went and preached that in the Church of England or in the Baptist Church. I often say, I can tell you exactly what will happen. Half of the people will probably say, oh, that was hateful, that was awful. I'm never listening to that man again. The other half will probably say, man, that was good, we need more of that. And there'll be arguments in the congregation. That is what would happen if we went and preached a message like that. These congregations are divided. They have people in there who maybe partially love the doctrines of the Bible, but they have people in there who don't love the Bible. The reason they don't love the Bible is because they don't love Jesus, because Jesus is the word who became flesh. And I praise the Lord that this fellowship is not that way. I pray the Lord that this fellowship consists of like-minded believers who speak the same things and have the same mind, the mind of Christ. And the reason that we have that is because we insist on one doctrine and one gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, are we completely 100% agreed on every single little thing? I'm sure not. I'm sure there are some minor little things that may differ among the congregation. Things that may be a bit more grey in the Bible. Sometimes the Bible is not as black and white as it always is. So maybe there might be some room for some partial minor disagreements on certain issues. However, it's the primary and even secondary issues which are not up for negotiation. They're not up for being bargained on. Now, Paul called this the gospel of first importance in 1 Corinthians 15.3, when he's talking about how Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures and then rose from the dead on the third day according to the Scriptures. He called this of first importance. In the New King James, this word is slightly differently, but he said this is of first importance. In other words, that is the one thing that we need to agree on, the gospel, the basic gospel of Jesus Christ, if there is no room for error. Now, that is also why Paul, again, is a Paul now, insisting on this one gospel. In Galatians chapter 1, in verse 8, whoever preaches a different gospel, let him be accursed. Now, these Galatians were not going around preaching a different faith or a different religion. They were preaching Christ. They were preaching Christ resurrected as the Son of God. And then they were saying, but now you need to observe this set of laws. You need to do this. You need to get circumcised. You need to observe the Sabbath. And you need to observe the dietary laws. All this kind of thing. Well, Paul says, whoever is preaching a different gospel, let him be accursed. Paul insists on that one gospel. And any variation of it is anathema in the Greek, accursed. It means to be set apart for destruction. 
And just like in the Galatians, the Ephesians also had the same problem. Because we see in Acts chapter 20, in verse 28, where Paul is saying goodbye to the Ephesians. I believe I read this verse last week. In Acts 20, verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. What did we say last week? The devil will try and come in from the outside and he will try and come in from the inside as well with all these different doctrines which Paul in 1 Timothy 4 called doctrines of demons. Speaking of 1 Timothy in chapter 3 in verse 7 he says, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. Again, this was a problem in the church in Ephesus. Remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Paul did not allow any room for any other doctrine to be taught. Nor give heed to fables, myths in some translations, fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience and from sincere faith. There's that word sincere once again. From which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. He's saying that these people do not understand what they're talking about. They have no clue. These people who come in and try and teach a different doctrine contrary to what was already taught, he's saying these people haven't got a clue. They understand nothing. And we've seen many times before that unfortunately God is not the only one who sends people into churches. Satan also sends him into churches as well. As I said last week, the difference is, is that God will always get rid of those who Satan has sent in. And those who God has sent in will always be made apparent. John is another one who insisted on one doctrine and no variation. In 2 John, 2 John verse 9, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Did you hear that? He who greets him shares in his evil deeds. In other words, these people who welcome those who bring false doctrine, they're as bad as the ones who bring the false doctrine. He who welcomes him shares in his evil deeds. Now, a way that we also remain united as a church, not just our love and the doctrine that we all keep, the doctrine of Christ, is to also remain in constant fellowship. God did not save any of us to be alone. He saved us to be together. The reason that he saved us, of course, was for Christ's sake, as it says. However, he didn't save us to just let us go and do our own thing. He saved us to then bring us together as believers. And that's why in Hebrews 10, in verse 25, it says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together or the gathering of the brethren. As is the manner of some, again, this is something the writer of Hebrews is rebuking here, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, people often quote this verse, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves with each other. But they don't read on the whole verse. It says, so much, so, so much more as you see the day approaching. What that means is, is that as we get closer to the end, fellowship will become more and more important. It will be more and more important for us to remain together and to remain united the closer we get to the return of Christ. As you see the day approaching, the more this becomes important. Now what the writer of Hebrews is actually doing here, he's using a Hebrew way of speaking called Calve Homer. Calve Homer. It means light and heavy. Light and heavy. What it means is, it means that something which is already true, something which is already important, something which is already urgent, becomes even more urgent, becomes even more important as we get closer to the end. 
That's a Hebrew way of thinking called kalve homer, light and heavy. Something is already true, something is already important, but it becomes even more important and even more urgent. Just like fellowship. Fellowship is important, but it's going to become more important the closer we get to the return of Christ. Because this world is getting dark, brothers and sisters. This world is getting very, very dark. The time is going to come where we're going to have to meet in basements, just like they do in China or Saudi Arabia. The time is going to come where true born-again Christians are going to be persecuted and not going to be allowed to meet in a nice hall like this. So fellowship will become more and more important the closer we get to the end. It's important now, but it becomes more important and more urgent the closer we get to the return of Christ. Now, these people who often break away from fellowships for no good reason, they say there's a reason which exists only in their own mind normally, it's normally because they've been hurt, possibly as well, by, by bad leadership. You know, I used to go to church many years ago, but then the pastor was caught embezzling money, so I don't go to church anymore. If the pastor was caught embezzling money, then just find a better church. God did not save you to be alone in the faith. These lone wolves who go around normally just want to seek after their own desire. And that's what it says in Proverbs 18, verse 1. It says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. So these people who break away from fellowship because they claim that the Lord has led them to. It's not because of the direction the fellowship's going in, it's because of the direction they're going in. And why are we told to remain in constant fellowship? Because animals go around in packs, don't they? They don't go around like lone wolves, they go around in packs. Why? Because they're safer that way. When predatory animals like lions or something go around hunting, they'll go after the ones who have strayed from the pack. You could have a pack of animals and then one or two have gone astray. They're the ones the devil's going to pick off. They're the ones the devil's going to devour. What does it say in 1 Peter 5 in verse 8? Be sober-minded and watchful for your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The devil is going to devour those who have strayed from the pack. When you're in the pack, you are safer. You're less of a target. If you've decided that you want to break away from the pack and do your own thing, then you are now a target for the enemy. He's going to devour you. And we saw 1 Corinthians 12, how it speaks about many different parts of the body, how they're all different and have different functions. However, those parts of the body only function when they are in the body. When you have a body part which is not connected to any body, it doesn't do anything, does it? It just sits there. The reason that it doesn't do anything is because it doesn't have life, does it? You have to be part of the body of Christ to actually have life. If you're a body part which is not part of the body, then you're just a dead piece, aren't you? You have to be connected to the body in order to function. A foot or a finger or an arm does not function by itself, it functions because it's connected to the body. And this is exactly the same for believers, members of the body of Christ. They will not function, they do not have life, if they are not in Christ, the body of Christ. That is what 1 Corinthians 12 is getting at. And this is the way that we build a fellowship which has impact not just on our local community, but on the world as well. Because I think these days, you take a lot of these modern churches, not just in this area, but all over the country and even over the world, particularly in America, a lot of these churches, if you took them away, no one would know any different. What would happen if you took some of these churches away? No one would be any the wiser. They would not know. If you took this church away, I think people would know. Where have those lunatics gone on a Thursday? They're not there anymore. People would know if this church disappeared. And that's the sort of church that we want to be, brothers and sisters, a church that has impact and a church that people know is present and a church that people will know is gone if ever we was disappeared. That's the sort of church that we want to build, a church which has impact. And the way that we do that is to have love and unity among the congregation, to show grace to one another, humility, which I'm going to speak about just now, and united in the same doctrine, and in constant fellowship with one another. That is how we remain a church who has impact. 
Because if not, if we don't have those things, we're a church who has no impact, just like the other Laodicean churches out there now. They have no impact, and if you took them away, no one would know any different. That is not the sort of church we want to be, brothers and sisters. If you're still in Philippians, go to chapter 2. Because, again, love and unity is something the Bible speaks about a lot, and something else the Bible speaks about a lot is humility. Humility, something else, again, people tend to not like to show. Grace and humility are two difficult things for the man or woman to show. And in Philippians 2, it gives us an example of humility, the best example. Philippians 2 from verse 1. Therefore, if, any is in, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. There's that exhortation again, to be of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility again, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And now in verse 5, he goes on to use the best possible example of humility the world has ever seen. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh and yet he humbled himself to become a man in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Not only did he humble himself and become a man just like you and I, but he also went to the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. What did Jesus say in Matthew 23, verse 12? Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You always see men in the Bible being humbled, but then exalted. Every time that happens, it's always to foreshadow Christ, who humbled himself, but then was exalted to the name of bubble names. Verse 10, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. That's right. Even those who have died without Christ are still going to be forced to confess his name. Verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's right. It doesn't matter whether you believe or not. It doesn't matter whether you love Christ or not. One day you are going to be forced to confess that he is Lord. You are going to be forced to bow the knee. Even Satan himself is going to be forced to confess that he is Lord. And he's going to have to bow the knee as well. If you haven't confessed Christ as your Lord, if you haven't bowed the knee, do it this side of heaven instead of the other side. Because those who refuse to bow the knee to Jesus Christ, God will say, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But those who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, they shall be saved and there is a kingdom awaiting them, a kingdom that shall never pass away. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. And as usual, the Bible does not say to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So when we hear these things, these instructions, these are not my instructions, these are God's instructions, we are to put them into practice in our life. Let us pray now for the strength to do that. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this day and for this gathering. We thank you, Lord, for these men and women of God who are here today to fellowship, to worship you, and to hear the word of God. And Lord, this word that you've instructed me to teach today, Lord, help us to not just hear it, but to put it into practice in our lives as individuals and also as a church family. Lord, we pray that you'll just help us to do those things which goes against the nature of man, to show grace, to forgive one another, to be humble, and also to be united in the same doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, the gospel of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to remain 
on that narrow way. Help us to not divert away from that path that you have ordained for us, Lord. Help us to remain steadfast upon your word. Help us to not compromise just like those other churches have, Lord. But help us to remain standing upon the rock. Lord, give us the strength to persevere in these last days as the days get darker and darker, as we see the coming King. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will just give us the strength to remain united and remain in fellowship and to sharpen one another. And Lord, we do thank you again for the truth of your word. Thank you that we have this word. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the spirit of truth to lead us into all truth. And that you've sealed us, Lord, with that spirit for the day of redemption. And Lord, help us to love one another so that others will see that we are your disciples. Help us to be shining lights for Jesus Christ. Help us to be good ambassadors of Jesus Christ in this dark kingdom. But above all, Lord, we want to give you thanks for our personal salvation. The fact that each of us have experienced a personal redemption from Egypt. That each of us who are born again have been snatched out of the fires of hell and transferred into the kingdom of God. Not because we deserve to, but because you have shown us so much grace, Lord, that we can never even match. We thank you, Lord for saving us. We thank you for sending your only son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And we thank you that we will also reign with him as kings and priests when he returns to reign on David's throne. And Lord, we long for that day and we look forward to that day. But we praise you and thank you. We lift your name above all names, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Thank you.